Um, so Laura, I'm just really happy to have you for Systems in Action. I was so excited that you agreed to speak. And, um, and of course your topic today on leadership is like something that I live every day and am looking at. Um, but if you will, would you give us a little bit about your background? I think you can probably describe it a little bit better than I could read it, and it might be a little bit more entertaining. Um, if <laughs> so, just give us a little bit about uh, where where you've been and how you've gotten to this point. Yes, well, it hasn't been a direct A to B route. I um, started uh, in college, really interested in. Um, social policies, public policy, how they affect families and children. I sort of segue from that. I mean, I sort of kept that as my base and then moved into really wanting to understand research methods, assessment, how we really can tell that we're making a difference in people's lives through different interventions and efforts. Um, so I spent you know, all of my time at Cornell sort of doing those things and finished my PhD and right at the end of my PhD, I crossed paths with a full-on systems thinker and systems theorist and started to understand through a grant that we were um, working on together for NSF, really the power of this new way of thinking about things and systems thinking as a concept and as a tool and as a method and how it could really change and almost sort of give teeth to the things I had been studying for so long in terms of, you know, understanding policy and systems that had really, that appeared really complicated and but were actually fairly complex. Um, and so, you know, that sort of kept me on my sort of policy base, but I sort of started to see things as systems and, and segued into really having an interest in not only systems thinking as a concept, but how we could really deconstruct it, understand it, and teach it. Um, because it was really a remarkable thing for me to, to learn it. And I thought if, you know, I would like to really be able to, so I have a background in translational research. And I thought I would really love to work with then my new partner in crime, how to really translate and teach and, and, and get people to really understand systems thinking at its core. And so that's when Derek and I started working in schools, kindergarten through grade 12, loved kindergartners, they learned it all really quickly, which then led us to believe, how can we make it so that everybody can learn as fast as a kindergartner? So that's sort of how uh, my path with systems thinking and now Cabrera Research Lab and Cornell has landed, is, is my own application of it, and then feeling like it was a, almost a, a responsibility to figure out how everyone else could learn it, because it really changed how I thought about things. That's sort of the nutshell of it, yeah. Great, great. I mean, you've had a very interesting path. And, you know, and we, we're living in such a chaotic world, uh, and especially in organizations or anywhere leaders show up. Leaders show up on the streets. I mean, you know, it's not just in organizations. And how do we somehow put that chaos in perspective so that um, it's not overwhelming? and that we can and deal with it. So I'm looking forward to your presentation and just let me remind everybody that's on the call, put your questions in the Q&A box or either in the chat box and we will make you a panelist and you can ask your own questions. So I just wanted um, to do that. Okay, thanks Laura, go ahead and get started. Well, uh, thanks and thanks for having me. I'm, ex I'm actually excited to be here. I. Um, I was fortunate enough to see the registration list. I saw some familiar names and not familiar names, so I'm happy always to meet and talk to new people about these ideas. Um, so we're gonna talk about the simple rules of systems leadership today. And um, my hope is to really, in you know, not more than 45 minutes or so, answer three main questions. Why systems thinking, I'm sorry, why systems leadership? What is systems leadership? And how do you do systems thinking and leadership in organizations? And if you think about it, we have two courses that we teach at Cornell, and they're based on two texts. And today we're going to talk about the top end of that pyramid, which is um, from our book, Flock My Clock, which really talks about how we leverage systems thinking inside of organizations to affect the outcomes we're seeking. So the way to look at this pyramid is that systems thinking at the individual level rolls up um, into the organizational level and sort of gives us some central tenets of systems leadership. And these are the two areas that Derek and I work on at Cabrera Research Lab in, in addition to sort of systems mapping. 
So this audience is going to get a 13 week course in 44 minutes and I have every confidence that you're all up to the task. So it's going to be fun. So, um, so as I said, we're going to deal with the organizational level, how, how we can leverage these systems thinking skills and organizations. And um, a few of you or some of you may have had the opportunity to hear Derek did a presentation with the same um, group with Deanna about systems thinking. And he talked a lot about systems thinking as a complex adaptive system that had within it um, four simple rules, distinctions, systems, relationships, and perspectives, and that the emergent property of those rules um, is you know, an adaptive thinker who can, who can really solve problems and is a systems thinker. And much like this, we have four simple rules of organizations with um, the, uh, the agents within an organization are the people and there are four sort of natural functions of systems which are vision, mission, capacity, and learning. And when those things are, are um, applied over and over again, the emergent property is an adaptive organization, almost a super organism that can sort of turn on a dime with very little effort. Um, and the thing that's important is every organization, your organization, is a CAS because by nature, because all human organizations are complex adaptive systems. So you don't get to choose whether or not it's a complex adaptive system, it just is. But what you do get to choose is whether your mental models of your organization are in alignment with the reality of your organization as, as it exists. And the important thing is what you get from making this choice is the benefits of an adaptive organization that learns and changes with its environment. And what we want to do is we want to sort of contrast where we've been to where we want to be. So let's think about our traditional mental models of organizations and how, how they work. And remember that they're deeply ingrained in us even today. And today we, we sort of, the traditional mental model used to be a clockwork, that an organization was like a clock. And it was highly influenced by the work of Frederick Taylor who had great research and he you know, came up with the scientific application of the 21 pound shovel. And Taylorism was really, really influential and it led to really great efficiencies in managing factories. But in today's world, which is competitive and which is volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous, we know that efficiencies, they're just, they're just not enough. And what we need to have is more of an adaptive organization that's quick and agile in its response to changes in the market. So this clockwork metaphor from before has had, and it still has a significant impact on how we think about organizations. And we can, um, and it can be described by its components, which are basically a set of mental models that are still seen in organizations today. And make no mistake, these old mental models are still impacting your culture and the potential impact of your organization. So let's talk about that. So the first of them is the concept of planning. The second is the idea of command. The third is the concept of control. And the final is this notion of utilize or utilization. And all of these work reasonably well because they make us feel like actually feel like we're in control of the process or the processes we're using until we get the results. And then we start to question these faulty mental models about our organization. So we need to really pick apart at them and look at them a little bit more in depth. So when we think about planning, we like to plan, we have strategic plans. Those of us who are over the age of 35 know that we used to have like 10 year plans and went to five year plans. Then we've moved down to just quarterly goals and so forth and so forth. But we need to think a little bit differently about planning because what we know is that what we plan for is not always what happens. And over the years, as the complexity of the world around us has, has changed, the horizon for planning has necessarily shrunk substantially from 10 to five to three years to less than a year. And now I think many organizations are, are literally just working quarter to quarter because they know that things are so uncertain. So we'd like to feel in command and the simplicity of this, this mental model, it comforts us. We like the idea that command as a function is simple. It just trickles down and it's just executed optimally. This is though what really is happening in organizations. 
And it's a funny slide if you take a minute to read some of the, the various types of relationships that we see happening in a traditional workplace. But the real point is that there are networks within organizations of formal and informal, um, informal uh, relationships inside of organizations and that these relationships exist and they don't necessarily adhere to this hierarchical tree. And what's really important is that we recognize that people exist in these influential networks with certain, certain nodes in that network having more influence than others and that this is the reality of how our organizations are structured. We need to recognize this as reality so that we can start to better understand how to leverage those relationships within our networks, within the organization. Does that make sense? Yes, I see Deanna saying yes. Yes, yes, it does make sense. And you're getting a lot of comments that it makes sense to several on the call too, so. Oh, good. And so, it, I mean, you can almost say that we're in love with this idea of this really sort of static hierarchical mental model. We love it so much that we've decided that we will use it as well to manage our organizational processes. And we are so smart that we do this by simply turning it on its side. And there you have it. It's now a flow chart, a Gantt chart, a workflow chart. And these are things that people also hold very near and dear to their heart in organizations. But here's the thing, we need to think a little bit differently also about our processes and our needs, for, our need for control. And we need to think about what effective reality-based processes would look like. And there are three things that I think are required for these processes to be more effective. The first is you have to have brutal honesty about your starting point. And you need to be really data-driven about where you are in that moment. The second thing is you need to have clarity in your ending point, your vision or your goal, because it's leaders that stand sort of in the future and they describe what they see, what that future is that they're hoping to bring about. And the third thing, which is really important, is you have to have flexibility and adaptivity in how you get there. And that requires knowing the simple rules that underlie your work. And finally, the traditional, and I would argue still somewhat contemporary mental model of organizations, sees humans as resources to be utilized or squeezed for all of their value to serve the organization. But we now know that organizations are starting to move away from the, this sort of traditional HR model towards a mental model of talent management. And talent management is a little bit less of a utilization paradigm and more of a developmental, incentives-based, motivational approach to managing people. So either way, the goal for managing humans is to leverage the relationships among them to create an agile superorganism that can adapt when it's necessary. And that's usually the result of external forces to the organization that that adaptation becomes necessary. So if we contrast these two, these two sets of ideas, what you see is a traditional organizational model actually works against the natural tendencies of the system and often will lead to muted or unsatisfactory results. But if you leverage the natural tendencies of a complex system via simple rules, this better aligns how we think our organization works with how it actually works. And then we can have a greater effect on the outcomes we seek. So VMCL, which is the model I'm going to talk about today, replaces this sort of clockwork approach to organizations with a more systemic approach, which is based on complex adaptive systems. And the insights I offer you, you know, I'm going to try to offer you today about VMCL, I'm hoping will help you move towards a more uh, reality-based, natural view of your organization, away from that mechanistic clock-like metaphor to more of a biological or flock-like metaphor of an organization. So VMCL has four, it has four simple rules, four critical parts, which are vision, which is the desired future state or goal, mission, which are the actions that are done repeatedly that will lead to your vision over time. Then there's capacity, which are all of the organizational systems that support your vision and you know, sort of indirectly also your vision. And then learning, which is the continual modification of your mental models based on feedback that's coming in from the external environment. 
And we're also gonna spend some time on that last piece, which is the underlying foundation of culture. And we'll also talk a little bit about the critical relationships between and among um, the parts in the model. And the, the, the most, one of the more important parts is we need to pay attention to the alignment between and among these components because this model relies on creating strong bonds between a vision and a mission, the capacitor systems and the mission, and the learning function feeding into the capacity. And as I said, culture sits at the base of the functions. And so we're going to also talk about how to focus your efforts on building a culture around these four functions and the shared mental models you're going to need to build to drive organizational behavior to where you want it to go. So let's talk a little bit uh, about each of these separately and then we'll tie them together uh, towards the end. So just as a quick note, uh, the book that I was talking about, we do have a checklist which sort of walks people through creating their own visions and missions and set up their systems and things like that. So that's something that uh, leaders often find very useful. So let's talk about vision. There are five things that are um, important about vision. It has to depict the desired future state. It has to be intrinsically motivating. It should be short and simple. It must be measurable. And importantly, it has to live in the hearts and minds of the agents within the system. It can't just be a picture up on a wall or a statement on a website. It has to actually be indoctrinated into the agents in the system. Two things about vision that are important. It is a natural function of any organization, whether it's purposefully designed or articulated by a leader. In other words, a system always has a purpose in and of itself. It's up to a leader whether or not they want to shape that and articulate it in a particular way towards a vision. And it's a core tenet of your culture that has to be shared. So even if a system, even in a system where no explicit vision has been stated, it does have a goal state, which will be driven by its members and needs to be, you know, because of, you know, possibly the purpose of a system is what it does. It is a central tenet of organizations that we have to pay attention to. The other thing that's important is if an organization naturally starts to have two or more visions, it becomes effectively visionless. If you think about it like these two guys in, the, in this canoe, if these two guys each have an individual division, uh, vision and they're working towards that, then the organization vision is the combination of them, which in effect cancels themselves out. So they're not gonna get very far, obviously. <laughs> they're gonna go in circles, if anywhere at all. And when we talk about a vision being short and simple, um, one of the ways we might get those two guys on the canoe on board is to articulate something that's simple and easy to understand Derek and I also, you know, often call it the nine-year-old test. So if you look at these examples, it's not important that you can read them fully, but just look at the size of those statements. And you ask yourself, how likely is it that you can get an entire organization to understand and know the vision and mission on the right versus the two on the left? And so that's why we always say it needs to be short and simple, because people need to be able to understand it, build a shared mental model about it, and be able to articulate, articulate it back to others in the organization. And your, when we say that your vision must be intrinsically motivating, it's important that you communicate your vision because your vision will affect your employees and it, therefore your organization. And this is backed by a lot of research into organizations. So for example, this Gallup poll tracked levels of employee engagement and reported that disengaged employees outnumber engaged employees by about two to one. Also, in uh, a recent uh, quality of life at work survey, what they found was that employees who found more meaning in their work were 93% more engaged with their daily work. They were almost three times more likely to stay with their company, and they were twice as satisfied with their jobs. And the authors of that study concluded that no single factor in their study influenced people's job satisfaction and likelihood to stay at an organization as much as finding a sense of meaning and purpose in their work. So what we know is engaged employees have a huge effect within organizations. So for example, engaged employees are 50% um, more productive, 33% more profitable, and they're responsible for 56% higher customer loyalty scores, and they're associated with 44% higher retention rates. 
And these factors, when you combine them together, they will produce significant long-term gains for any organization. And this is why we say that our vision has to be short, simple, and it has to be measure, measurable, and it has to be motivating. And here's an example of a vision and mission statement that we saw one day when we were out on the road. So at the same time that there's this abundance of research that shows that vision and mission are highly correlated with performance and success, there's a whole nother body of research um, that shows how confused we are about what constitutes a vision and a mission. And the, best, the most likely point of confusion is that we tend to conflate the two ideas, vision and mission. And this example makes us laugh and it's consistent with this research that people are actually confusing vision and mission. Because if you look at this poster, in the case where they say their vision is that they will be, but their mission is stated as that they already are, how is that gonna guide anybody's work? And how is that not going to confuse people and in a, every day as they sit down and start to work towards a vision that they can't understand based on how it's articulated? So if we talk about um, mission, mission is similar to vision in some ways. But mission is um, something that we do repeatedly. Um, and we, it's the actions we do on a daily basis to try to work towards a vision. It over time brings about the vision. Our mission statement should explain who's doing what for whom. It needs to be clear and concise and easily understood, just like a vision is short and simple. It also is equally important that it's measurable, like a vision has to be measurable. It must live in the hearts and minds of people in the organization. And the other thing about this uh, mission is when you get the opportunity to actually do your mission, the moments where you're actually interacting with a customer or a client or whoever it is that you're trying to affect, those moments are, shouldn't be considered to be precious. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. And so there's been a lot of work on and a lot of research on corporate missions. And when you, when you do sort of a meta-analysis across this research, what you'll see is the study of missions is plagued by this sort of lack of consensus on or clarity about what a good mission should con could contain. One study that described these 23 years of research on definitions of mission statements showed a wide variance of how people think about mission. And what this table shows is the author's summary of the content of mission statements from key works on the subject. And after reviewing all of this research, what the authors concluded was that there are Quote, there appears to be virtually no consensus as to what mission statements should or should not include. So we know that we need to try to recapture or re, you know, come up with a way to make it so that we, we can not only distinguish vision and mission from each other, but also what, is, what, is the what are the necessary components to a good mission statement that will really guide people's work. And so if you take a wider look at organizations, not just as a noun, but the concept of organization as a verb across natural and social systems, what you see is not just a human-based definition of mission, but sort of a feature of organization itself. And this is why we say the MCL are functions of all forms of organization, and that ranges from organs to organism to organizations. And when we talk about a good mission statement, this is sort of like, I don't know, some of you might remember Mad Libs, those things where you filled in the words and they became funny sentences and your children think they're still hilarious today, which is great. One of the few things that have gone from generation to generation. So this is sort of the mission statement Mad Lib. And a good mission statement will explain who's doing what for whom. And when it's done repeatedly, it will lead to your vision. So let me give you a couple of quick examples of this. So here's a really simple vision and mission, right? If, and I'm not, I'm not advocating any particular religion at all, but if say, for example, your vision was a Catholic world, well, then your mission is very simple. You need to simply go out every day and convert the unconverted. So for example, I go to person A and I say, hey, are you a Catholic? And they say, yes. I don't have any work to do there because they've already been converted. I go to person B, they're not, and they say, oh, Here's where my work comes in. And now I try to convert that person into that religion. And here's sort of what we call the granddaddy of the best visions and missions, simple vision and mission, which is if the vision 
is resilient biodiversity, then the, the mission is sort of already programmed into every organism such that they know that in order for that to, to be happening, all they have to do is go forth and multiply. It's very simple. And, they're, and you can see that they're coupled in that if, the, if those missions are done over and over and over again, the emergent property of that will be the visions as they're stated. And here's another example that's maybe a slightly more serious in, in some ways. So General George Casey, um, he, he's sort of a, a natural born systems thinker. And he, he came up with this great clear mission, which is clear, hold, build. And what he said about it was, it's essential to distill a message into a few key points and hone its delivery. Clear communication is like sharpening a pencil. You slowly remove the unnecessary until you're left with a pointed, useful message. And after trying and failing to communicate our strategy, we went back to the drawing board and came up with clear, hold, build, and re-communicated, and it was much better understood. So that's a great mission. And what's, what's really interesting about this particular mission is they were sort of General Casey's three simple rules. And the great thing about them is they were able to be applied at multiple levels of scale in his efforts. So for example, a platoon of soldiers applied the mission to clear a house of dangers, set up security measures to hold that house, and then needed to build relationships in that house to ensure longer term success of their efforts. And then this applied at every level of scale upwards from neighborhoods to towns to regions to eventually state. And so what he understood is that systems thinking isn't just something that generals do um, to get the big picture. It's something that all the agents, the soldiers and the commanders had to do at every level in the organization. And all he needed to do was help all the agents identify the simple rules that collectively led to the emergent property that they were seeking. And that's why he was so successful. And if you remember also, I had mentioned that missions must be measurable. And here's an example of how we could set some metrics for the three simple ideas of his mission. And you can see that all we have to do is sort of track the number of things we're clearing, how long we can hold things, the types of relationships we're building. And so we can see that we're actually accomplishing that mission through measurement. And that's an important tenet that we need to remember. And the other thing that I had said earlier is that we want to make sure that vision and missions don't live in frames or live, you know, live in frames or are posted in websites, but they really are something that are sort of indoctrinated or really held in the hearts and minds of everyone in their organization. And part of the reason that's important is because we also said they need to be intrinsically motivating. So we want all of our, our employees or whoever it is that we're talking about to wake up excited to work towards our vision through our mission. And we want that to be intrinsically motivating. We don't want to have to constantly be sort of extrinsically motivating people. That's not how we, you know, that's not a healthy way to do it. And then also, if you remember, we talked a little bit about mission moments. And when I, when I talk about mission moments being precious, what we mean is that, you know, if you have clients or uh, customers that you need to deal with, when you have the opportunity to interact with them, it has to be treated as a precious moment because if you do that mission moment well, you're going to get more of them. But if that mission moment goes poorly, you'll get fewer of them. And a restaurant is, an, is a great example of this. And you can think about the last, I mean, now it's a long time ago since we ate in restaurants, but if you think about the last time you were in a restaurant, probably five or six months ago, you know that if, if something wasn't right, if something wasn't right with your meal, or if the restaurant was not clean, or the waiter was obnoxious, or whatever it was, if that mission moment for that restaurant with you as a customer didn't go well, you're not gonna go back. And so they're gonna have fewer and fewer opportunities to execute their mission, which means they're not going to get to their vision for their restaurant. And so when we move from vision and mission, now we talk about capacity, if you think about it as vision is sort of what you see and mission is what you do, then we need to think about capacity as the state of readiness of your organization to do your mission. And we also need to recognize that it's a system of systems 
And we often will, as we talked about um, workflow processes and, and Gantt charts and things, we also will map our capacity frequently to understand or better, better design our systems to be better at doing our mission. And we also need to remember that we have to have a learning function in our organization to expand our capacity. Purpose, we have a learning function to expand our capacity. And so when I say it's a system of systems, what I mean it has to be tied to your mission, meaning if there are systems that are not serving your mission, then you need to think about why, they're, why they exist in the first place, because we really want to laser focus on being able to execute the mission of the organization. And we don't want redundancy with this within a system. We don't want two systems that are doing the same thing. We don't want a bunch, if you see on the right side of that chart, you don't want just a bunch of disconnected systems. That's how we get to things like silos and a lack of organizational communication, which slows us down and makes us less effective in doing our work. And if you think back to that um, mission moment in the uh, restaurant, you have to remember that that moment where a customer is sitting down to eat, at, in this case, a burger and fries, there's a lot of capacitor systems behind it. So in a restaurant, you have to think about all the capacitor systems that have to be in place to ensure that that customer has the best experience. So there's the cleaning crew, the launderer, there's the back end systems of the financial systems that create the chef's ability to buy the best ingredients, and then there's the chefs themselves. And it's all of those systems are solely designed to maximize that diner's experience, which is the mission moment, and then hopefully gain more customers. And in a, and in a more sort of complex example, uh, many people have talked about that once you sort of have articulated your vision and mission, and it's, if it's as complicated as sort of the stability in, in Afghanistan, it really helps to map it out, to better understand the systems, and to be certain that all of those systems are building capacity to do your mission daily. So when you're thinking about capacity, um, there are three things that you should think about. One is think about, think about a capacitor system in your organization and ask yourself, how is that system providing capacity for me to do my mission? And then once you've answered that, you need to identify where your mission moments are happening and figure out how the success of those moments can be measured. And if you think about um, capacity, capacity has to have within it a, a very purposeful learning function. And so, it, you know, Jack Welch said famously, um, an organization's ability to learn and translate that learning into action rapidly is the ultimate competitive advantage. And that is the driver of an adaptive organization, that concept that in order to, to, um, to be competitive, to adapt to external forces, we have to be constantly learning, which means we have to constantly be seeking feedback from the external environment and taking that feedback in to change and modify our systems to be more on point to our mission, which will eventually lead to the vision. So when we talk about learning, there are three primary things we think about in terms of learning. First, it was, we have to harness the power of mental models. The second is we have to train people to think in order to learn, which seems obvious. And it is obvious, but it's also something we have to really take to heart, that we have to focus on how people are thinking things through and how they learn the different things we need to teach them to be more effective uh, within an organization. And then we also need to recognize that in order to be responsive, we have to constantly evolve our mental models when we receive feedback, either inside or outside of our system. So, hold on, there we go. So the next question is, how do we create adaptive learning organizations? So let's start with harnessing the power of mental models. So how do we harness the power of mental models and train people to think? This is something that we've been working on a long time and thinking about. And let's start first by seeing the connection among individual learning, building mental models, and organizational and collaborative learning, which you can see here in the top part of the pyramid. And what you see is when you have clarity 
if your vision and mission, that will lead to more clarity where most of the work actually happens, which is in your capacity and learning system, in your organizational capacity and your organizational learning. And this will all lead to the knowledge of an organization at any given time or a knowledge base. And so we have to focus first, if you look at that bottom level of the top, organizational learning, which is about mental models and how we share changes in mental models. So we're gonna focus on mental models. And I'm sure this audience has seen this slide before. This is a pretty well-known slide. So when you think about this sort of metaphor of the iceberg, what systems thinking is doing is at a fundamental level, it's telling us to look deeper beyond the surface features of a problem or an issue or something that's happening and look at how the world works and how we think. And if we think of it as this iceberg, then there's more to it than meets the eye. Say you or your organization are the boat, hopefully it's not, it kind of looks like the Titanic, but let's pretend it's not the Titanic. And so what we would say is we want you to look beyond that surface level and not just react to events, because if that's all you can see, at the, if all you can see is what's happening at the surface, all you're really going to be able to do is react. But if you go underneath that and you start to look at systemic patterns or, you know, in other words, the repetition of events over time, then you can start to be more predictive. And this gives you more sometimes even just seconds, minutes, days or weeks to respond to an issue rather than an off-the-cuff reaction. If you go even deeper under that and you see system structure, and we all know the pop popular saying about system thinking is system structure determines behavior, then what that means is the way systems are organized will actually determine the behavior. And if we see these underlying system structures, then we can start to design those structures to bring about the behavior that we are actually looking for or the desired behavior that we're seeking. And then if you look even beneath sort of system structures and we think about sort of more of the research in neuroscience and cognition, for a while we didn't really understand how mental models were built. Um, and we didn't know how either to align those mental models with how the real world system structures were working. So when we see that there's this sort of underlying cognitive code that allows us to understand how we're structuring our mental models, then we can transform how we frame, design, or predict, or react to things because we can see what the root, the root causes or the root issue is that we're, how we're thinking about it in the first place. So one of the most important cultural shifts that you can make in an organization is to move away from um, this kind of mentality of this is the way things are to this is our mental model of how things are. So one of the things we think about with learning is that we need to introduce this concept, the reality of mental models, the fact that we are literally experiencing reality through our mental models almost as a lens, we also have to sort of develop a common language about mental models. Then we have to build some skills in how we build them, share them, and evolve mental models to, to exhibit or demonstrate learning. And often in organizations, we can also use technology to help support those functions. And, you know, we've often said that, you know, these wicked problems are the result from that mismatch between how we think um, things are working and how they're actually working in real world systems. And it's that mismatch that we need to, that we need to acknowledge and then work to align how we're thinking about something, our mental models of something and how it's existing in reality. And the only way to do that is through a purposeful feedback loop that we need to create as organizational leaders or organizational members. So back to this slide that we had in the beginning, um, this is a real world example of a mismatch that happens in, mis in modern organizations because we think that the system works like that clean cut hierarchical tree at the top of the slide, but really the truth is it's existing in a far more interesting and dynamic network of relationships uh, between and among the people that, doesn't, that causes us not to adhere to the clean model at the top. And what's important, as I said earlier, is that we recognize that fact because that can change how we uh, how we influence and, and use those relationships to better bring about what we're trying to do. And, you know, simply, simply put, 
and we've probably showed this a, a lot, but simply put, we need to recognize not only that we have mental models, we need to, we need to really um, take it to heart that our mental models are just approximations of the real world. And we need to, to purposely seek out feedback in the form of information from the real world, which will, which will feed back into modifying our mental models. And that's how over time, going through that cycle over and over again, our mental models become better aligned, which means our decisions are more effective, our innovations are more useful, et cetera, et cetera, because we're, we're acting more and more closely to the reality of how things are. Notice also that when we talk about building a mental model, there are two components in a mental model, which is the information and the thinking. And so when we structure information, um, we bring it meaning, meaning uh, the mental model, which is M or knowledge or meaning, however you want to think about it, is the result of structuring any information or data through thinking. And we think of thinking as making distinctions, organizing things into systems, recognizing relationships, and taking perspectives. So that's what the thinking part is comprised of. So when we say we train people to think in order to learn, this is what we're talking about. So, you know, Derek and I started our lab um, many years ago, it gets many and many more as I realize that time is fast, time is moving fast. Once you hit a certain place, it goes faster. Um, and so, as I said earlier, when I was talking in the beginning, that we really think systems thinking is relevant and useful to everyone, both personally and professionally. And we've been really fortunate to, um, to be able to teach these systems, think, you know, these ideas in many different contexts, from K to 12 schools, to graduate schools, Cornell, Silicon Valley companies, federal government agencies, nonprofits, and also we've been doing a lot of work recently with the military at West Point, um, the military academy. And you know, we've learned a lot from being able to try to teach these same things across many contexts, but there are two things that I think have been really important that we've learned along the way. The first is that learning to be a systems thinker really involves almost unlearning deeply ingrained habits of thinking. And what we find is many people have trouble sort of escaping the, the shackles of a lifetime of sort of implicit or explicit reliance on sort of what we consider traditional thought styles like linear and binary thinking, that we're sort of trained into linear and binary thinking, even though we don't naturally exist as only linear and binary thinkers. And um, what's interesting, as I alluded to earlier, is given sort of the sophistication and application at the highest levels of research analysis and, and sort of problem solving, systems, thinker, systems thinking is actually sort of ironically easier to teach to preschool and elementary students they learn it with far greater ease because they haven't had their natural tendency to think systemically dulled over the years through this logic that's been taught in traditional education. So systems thinking or DSRP is sort of a new paradigm of thinking. It's, a, it's more of a multivalent form of logic and it, it encourages us to see sort of webs of causality and to think beyond the binary and beyond just simple cause and effect. And one of the things we have to do is we need to expand our ways of thinking and practice, 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 and practice it because that's how we will rewire our neuronal pathways to take into account multivalency and the nonlinearity that exists in systems today. So it's literally trying to unlearn and, and undo that sort of what's become almost ingrained in us, lock in of sort of linear, linear and binary ways of thinking. And the second thing that we've learned is not just the, is, is the importance of communicating to people that we all already use the rules of cognition. We're all already making distinctions. We're all already organizing ideas into systems. We're seeing relationships. And without, without always being conscious of it, we're taking at least one perspective, if not many perspectives to understand ideas. And so we really think one of the, the, the short-term solutions is to practice thinking about your own thinking and over time developing that metacognitive awareness of how you're bringing meaning to your information, how you're building ideas. 
And so when we talk about training people to think in order to learn, we're talking about um, really applying systems thinking and DSRP to any, any problems or situations that somebody's thinking about. So let me just talk about these for a few minutes in case you haven't become familiar with DSRP because uh, it's a part of our learning component. So basically, it's four simple things, distinctions, systems, relationships, and perspectives. Each one of those four things has two elements to it. And in those things, the, el the one element is always implying the other and vice versa. So in distinctions, the two co-implying co elements of making distinctions are identity and other, meaning we're always identifying ideas or things and then distinguishing them from other things or ideas. And it simply involves, distinction making just involves drawing boundaries, which is an essential practice of systems thinking. The systems rule is fairly simple. It's part and whole, and the elements, you know, part and whole are the two elements of the rule, meaning you can't have parts without holes and holes with parts. We're constantly organizing ideas into systems of parts and holes, or we're working with ideas in the way that others have organized them for us. And systems thinkers will often focus on defining the system and setting the boundaries and then making sure that the, that the parts are organized in a very particular way based on their understanding. And it's really important to be aware that anything can simultaneously be a part and a whole. That's an important sort of understanding of systems thinking. And then if you move into the relationships role, the two elements of relationships are action and reaction. And we don't, get, um, we don't get far in understanding systems without understanding that parts are interrelated. They can, the relationships can be direct or indirect, correlational or causal, they can be feedback loops. And we know that anything can be related to other things or it could be the relationship between things. And the perspectives rule is that any idea can be a point or a view of perspective. So there's the, the seer, and the thing that's seen, the view. And we have to be mindful that it's impossible to distinguish any idea, identify a relationship, or arrange parts and holes of a system without taking a perspective. There's always a perspective involved. So I'm aware of the time. I'm gonna skip through one of these examples and get to culture. Is that all right, Dana? Yes, that's fine. Okay, so I'm gonna skip through this, but just think about a pond and how interesting a pond is all the distinction systems, relationships, perspectives that you can make about a pawn. And basically when you're thinking about any simple idea or any idea, if you ask one of these, you know, these four questions, what are the distinctions I'm making to frame it? What are its parts? Are there relationships among the parts I'm not seeing? Are there different perspectives I could take to better understand the idea? That's what we mean when we say train people to think in order to learn, to have those kinds of questions in their mind as they're trying to come understand something. Evolving our mental models is what I spoke about earlier, where we're going constantly through that feedback loop. And that when we go through it every I mean, more and more and more, we're better aligning our mental models with reality. So let's, um, let's talk about culture a little bit. And as a, as a member of an organization, as um, the learning function, you need to think about what are the things you're purposefully doing to support organizational learning. How do people inside of an organization share their learning with the organization? And how could we use technology or other tools to facilitate that learning so that we can distribute that knowledge across the organization? You don't want all the, org the, the organizational knowledge to sit in one spot. You want it to be distributed so that everybody is um, learning from every other thing. We'll move through that. Remember I told you we need to focus on the relationships, meaning that our vision, mission, capacity, and learnings are all lining up. And let's talk about culture. <clears throat> so that was VMCL sort of in the fast track. Culture is at the base of VMCL. Um, we need to share the mental models that we have about vision, mission, capacity, and learning to drive our organizational behavior. Um, and what's important is that most people um, think of culture as sort of amorphous. It's intangible, treated as sort of mysterious. But the question is, can, it, can we purposefully build a culture? And if we get clear on what we mean by culture, we can actually build it and change it. So you have employees and customers um, coming and going in and outside of your organization, but there is always a culture in your organization that persists. 
and where culture is concerned, success is due to the sharing and diffusion of mental models. And if you can harness your culture, then you can harness the power of this VMCL model um, so that you don't end up with just a few well-written statements and a couple of maps as a proxy for your culture. And culture is what happens when people possess the share, they have the same mental models about things that matter. And this is the contrast to just sharing information like a memo or a document, meaning you have to actually build the same mental models. So culture is the crux of VMCL and VMCL is the crux of culture. So those things interact very powerfully. And let's just sum it up here where you have systems thinking is DSRP that teaches us how we build, share and evolve mental models. We know that individual learning happens when we change a mental model. Organizational learning happens when we have a change in a mental model that's shared across the agents in an organization. And that that culture is comprised of all of those shared mental models. So it's developing an awareness of and willingness to challenge mental models that facilitates the individual learning that drives organizational learning and all the way up to vision. So we gotta build a culture of systems thinkers that drive learning to improve, improve capacity, to do your mission, and then you'll get your vision. And that's it in a nutshell in 53 minutes instead of 45.